uh, for the faces I know and to the faces I don't know, welcome um, everybody. So um, it's really exciting for me to introduce Wesley Hicks um, to you. So I'm going to kind of read a formal thing and then I'm going to say a few things. Um, so Wesley Hicks is a multi-genre artist who works with ceramics as his material of choice to make unusual musical instruments and multi-sensory interactive sculpture. His ceramics are used as a vessel for sound, taste, smell, touch, and visual splendor. Uh, his compositions and artwork deal with the human recreation of nature, forging a hyper-real synthetic nature. His works include scent sculptures that are filled with the smells collected from nature around Southern California, maybe not Southern Oregon, uh, flavors and experimental, and experimental uh, salts uh, as, as works of art, and even musical scores that recreate the sound of bird calls, walking in the woods, and the sound of a flowing river. Many of the ceramic instruments he built function as large-scale ensembles. These ensembles include the River Rock Ensemble, 150 instruments, the Pitch Fluid Ocarina Ensemble, still in force, 25 instruments, and the Juice Rinas, which is a collaboration of those, uh, with the over 100. Um, the performances of these ensembles include interaction with the public and interaction with the architecture of public institutions. Notable performances have happened at the Getty, the Hammer Museum, Palm Springs Art Museum, and Cal Arts. His path to being an artist, instrument maker, and researcher has been complex. He received his BFA in ceramics at CSU Long Beach in 2015, where he focused on building ceramic sound sculptures. This interest led him to receiving his MFA in art and experimental sound practices at CalArts in 2018. He continues to be an instrument builder and artist, making an intermediate work that focuses on experimental, experimental multi sensory experiences as our vast resident here at SOU. Um, so, uh, I met Wesley when he was about 22 years old. Uh, he was in the first class I ever taught as an art professor. Um, and at the end of the first class, he had this beautiful thing on his, hanging around his neck. And, and we were talking, I think it was probably the end of the second class, we were talking, and I could ask him what that was. And uh, he puts it up to his lips, and he goes, <laughs> and, was, and then puts it down. He goes, and I hate it. <laughs> in this almost precocious way. And, and, and I love it. And it was this moment, about a month later, maybe two months later, there was a project, and it was, it was the soft sculpture project. And he brought in 30 little Ziploc bags with all these little cut up pieces of, of, of uh, plant material. They all looked the same. And for a soft sculpture, he had everybody go around the room and just smell these little bags. And, and, and these, I tell you about these because. As an artist, you don't always know what's going to stick. Um, but about five years later, I was working on a project, and I said, Wes, could we turn one of these sculptures I'm doing, at the, like three days before the final thing, into a, into a, into a ocarina? He said, yes. And, and that, I think, is my instruction for Wesley. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Wesley talk. It's going to be a mile a minute. It's going to slow down. It's going to be awesome. I'm really excited for it. Wesley, thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, as everyone's been saying, I'm Wesley. I'm the visiting artist in ceramics. Um, here we have a picture of a bunch of wacky musical instruments I made uh, circa 2019 or so. I really wanted to start with this image to show three features of many of my work, and that everything's really colorful, everything is referencing nature in some way, and everything is messy. Um, and there's a kind of cacophony chaos that I really enjoy, and hopefully this talk will really embody that as well. Uh, I'm going to start with this self-portrait I made. <laughs> this is a self-portrait I made of myself right before going to grad school. And this was one of my favorite works. I, I made an imaginary company, and I said, oh, what if there was a company that inoculated you with fungus, and then you grow mushrooms out of your chest as a fashion object? And I'm like, oh, but it would make you like really sick. And so uh, I, I rubbed this like, green pigment all over my face, and I was like getting ready for this huge photo shoot. I like set up the stuff in my studio, and then my eye, I got like the, the powder in my eye, and my eye was like swollen. I'm like, oh no, I ruined my entire photo shoot. And they're like, well, maybe not. <laughs> and so this, I think this really gets at this kind of like attitude about art of like, sometimes you control things, sometimes you don't, and sometimes the outcomes are just absolutely better when things get a little out of control. I'm going to talk for a minute about the themes in my work. So a lot of my work is intermedia or intergenre. So I'm, I'm interested in taking two forms of art and combining them. 
I'm also interested in like scooting the line. I love it when someone says, oh, are you sure that's a work of art? That's like, I did it. I made a good piece of art. And then I love the senses. And so I also include text in my senses because text is a unique mode of engagement with a work. So you're going to see a lot of my works have text involved in them in some way because I think it's one way to grasp at emotions that none of the other senses can and it also enhances this interaction. And then I love the idea of making things that look like they're from nature, but they're like ridiculous. And I love the idea of synthetics. Like a lot of people shy away from something just being synthetic all on its own. And I think it's one of the most marvelous things that we can do as humans because that's kind of our thing. We're the synthetic realm. So we should really embrace it. And then I call it the hyper real. So these objects that are too colorful, too vibrant, too noisy, uh, they're kind of hyper real versions of what we see in, in the wild. They're hyper real versions of nature. I, I also do the thing I call material theater. I love using tons of materials. And when someone looks at the object, they're like, oh, that's paint or maybe not. Oh, that's fur or maybe, I'm not sure what that is. And it's like this weird game that you can play where if someone can investigate an object and think, it's like reverse engineering it to figure out how you made it and what it's made out of. And then I like self-contradiction. So I like lying in my work. I like saying weird things like I founded a company. I didn't really, but that's why I have to tell people because it's a story. And so these contradictions are kind of fundamental. So like sometimes I'm like deeply tender about nature and then other sides I'm like just insulting nature. There's like completely contradictory. And then um, I think my meaning making is something based off of something I call associativeness. It's basically our brains like to connect things together. We see two things. We see lilacs, we see the color lilac, and we associate them. And that's, I think, a really important thing to think about throughout these works, is that's one of my biggest driving forces, is not to be completely logical, but to just grab associations and go with them. And then I like making art for personal reasons. Um, several of the things I'm showing here today, I have never shown in any formal contexts. I'm going to go over plenty of works that have been documented and photographed beautifully, but the, my works that I love the most are ones I make in my bedroom, I make for myself, and words that don't necessarily have like a lot of oomph to them as it's the form of like uh, social communication in the big, like big picture. Like they don't go in a gallery. They go somewhere personal to me. And so I'm going to start with something I call my COVID works. So during COVID, I started making these poetic pieces uh, where I was using pieces of nature. So the first one I call Else. And so I viewed this as somewhat of a self-portrait of myself during COVID. Uh, so this is the day I made the sculpture, and this is one week later. Um, I, I really fascinate with the word Else because it's always combined with the word or. So you never see it out there in the wild on its own. And so this is the death of or. That's kind of what I'm calling this piece. And then the other COVID piece I want to show is, I call it Tuesday. So I, I was taking branches and I was writing the days of the week on them every time the day of the week occurred. So this is Tuesday. I wrote Tuesday on it every Tuesday during lockdown. Uh, and so like, you know, these themes, I think over the themes I said, you know, text, themes of like associativeness, themes of like absurdity and all of these contradictions going on are all present, I think, in these works. That, that makes it a great intro. And so I'm going to jump back quite a lot. Oh, yeah, I have one more. I forgot about it. So uh, last year, me and my boyfriend bought a church, and we attempted to make the church into a giant art center. Uh, I'll come back to this later, but it does count as a COVID project. Um, so here's a photograph of part of the panoramas I made of the church when we bought it. And at the end, if I have time, I'll take you through a tour of the church. Um, so now I'm going to go straight to my early works. These are things I made during my undergrad to my mid-grad career. I think it's super important. Most of this audience in front of me are students. They're undergrads here at SOU. And I'm talking about crazy stuff like this, making weird instruments. I didn't start there. I started in a much more approachable position as an artist. And so I think I really need to like show you all kind of where I started so you have some context for yourselves. And so this is from my thesis show in my undergrad at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, at the time, I was super interested in machine parts. I was kind of interested in reliquaries and like sacred objects. And I made these, these are all ceramic. Uh, these are gold coated mystery machine parts. And so they're, they're covered in gold foil. I also was really interested in these kind of blob sculptures. I was really interested in like materials, like mysterious metals or mysterious materials and like containing them. And so um, these were like, I made several of these sculptures like this. 
This, I think, was the most successful. This one really looks like oil blobs on a surface. Or I imagine this purple surface vibrating, and they're kind of like this undulating forms. And again, these are all painted ceramics. But you can really see my themes of the bright hyper-real and references to nature start showing up in my work in these. I call these my stacked dumplings. <laughs> I just really love this piece. It's so vibrant. And then getting a little bit later, um, this is when I was prep. I, I had a year in between a postgrad before I applied to grad school. These were made during that year. Um, these are a distillation of my fascination with little tiny orchids. Uh, and so these are orchids that I made out of tons of mixed material. Uh, I really went away from ceramics a bit and was interested in like, oh, I should use paper and yarn and uh, have this element of familiar, unfamiliar, where you kind of jump back and forth. And so here's a nice little close-up. And uh, these are all, the, the mountings these are made of are ceramic. And they're just uh, lots of paint and material stacked on top of it. Uh, this is another work I made in the same period. I was really interested in entomology and like the act of like pinning insects. I thought it was super strange. Um, you know, you see like bird collections or you see insect collections and they're like in these filing cabinets and they're like sorted and organized. And there's a lot of this very strange mindset that I was endlessly fascinated with. So I was making these mysterious objects that have been pinned and they're kind of like attached to boards. And the boards are ceramic and the objects other than the feather are all ceramic as well. And then the feather's made of paper. And then this is uh, right on my intro to grad school. Um, I was really interested in trying to incorporate more senses in this work. And so this is a magnolia branch with wasp nests. Um, then wasp nests have little speakers on them and the wasps have a conversation that you can listen to. But you have to like walk all the way up until your ear touches it because it's so quiet. And so um, this, this kind of orifice shape, this idea of like something you have to reach right up with your face or your body is something you'll see later in my work quite a lot. I'm going to go straight into my scent works. Uh, so this is a non-chronological talk. We're going a mile a minute, but there's, uh, I kind of thought it'd be best to do it by genre rather than in order because it's so hard to explain where my brain goes. I'll make a scent piece. I'm like, no, nah, I got to do a painting now. I'm like, no, I did a painting. Maybe I'll do something that's a sculpture with a bunch of clay. I'm like, oh, I'm bored of clay. I want to paint. And I'll just jump back and forth. And so it's very hard to explain my practice. It's kind of parallel practices that are building upward. And so during grad school, I really got interested in working with scent. Um, if anyone's worked with it, it is a messy and deeply confusing subject. Uh, you have these little bottles of oil that if you touch it, it can burn you. It's a thousand times too strong in the bottle. And then you have to decant tiny amounts of it and mix them into recipes, and then suddenly you have a smell. Um, I loved learning it. It's like perfect for my scientific side of my mind to really investigate how all these things work. So on the top, you can see the little bottles, and you can see some of these scent strips where I'm smelling things and testing things. And then below, you can see these early perfumes that I made. And of course, being this artist obsessed with color, I had to make them very colorful. Here you'll see what that turned into. These bags contain a vial with a meticulously crafted scent. This is from my mid-residence show at CalArts during my grad program. This is really a, a great photo to show like, what the background of working with this stuff is like. And it's like all non-visual, and then suddenly the object I create is a deeply visual object. So these are, I call them my scent bells. So these are, the idea of these is that you walk up and you go, and you smell them like you would smell a flower. Uh, they're ceramic vessels, and each one contains a smell. Uh, ironically, I placed the first one is entirely synthetics, but every other of these sculptures was made from smells that I had distilled around Southern California. And so this one's called Field. This one was uh, collected from uh, partially desert grasslands around California, where I collected wild material, distilled it, placed it inside the vessels that you could smell, kind of like a scent landscape. And then I've taken some of the grasses and dyed them red with this like weird crimson peacock feather effect. <laughs> um, this is another one of the works. This one's called Barn. This is made from mushrooms that I collected near a barn. And uh, this one has a really musty, icky, mushroomy smell. It's kind of moldy. Perfectly safe to breathe, but really weird smelling. And then around it, it surrounded it with spore prints that I made from mushrooms. So how are these things made? 
So this is my essential oil distill. Inside there is about a hundred years growth of a creosote bush that I collected near Mojave, California. Uh, and so creosote in particular grows overwhelmingly slow. But um, this jar contains what would have amounted to like almost a hundred years worth of growth from these plants. Um, luckily, I collected these from a site that was being developed. I didn't go and like murder a bunch of plants out in the wild. Um, but I think this is like a really beautiful image to get at the sort of like, this is what most of this project looked like for me. And so here is me distilling catnip. I put a nice photo of catnip so you know what it looks like. Uh, and this is the entire setup. There's a boiling tank, the plant material, it steams over, and then it's condensed on the other side. Um, here's another scent project I did. Uh, these are maps of the campus of CalArts. And below them are spray bottles, each containing a scent that I designed. And I wanted to do these scent interactions. So the idea here is that at a certain place in time, I would go to either a room, a hallway, or an exterior space of the campus, and I would spray this smell. And if you were to walk past the area, it would be very strongly scented of that scent. And it was sort of this strange interaction that would happen uh, to anyone, regardless if they were involved in the show or not, walking through that space. And so the first two green bottles are very herbaceous smells, mostly distilled from plant materials around campus. The blue bottle smells like the scent after rain. It has kind of a petrature scent to it. And then the two orange bottles mostly smell of citrus. Notable, the end one is burnt oranges. So, you know, take a flame to an orange, burn the entire outside, and then distill it. Um, which is a, it's a, it's a scent that's fascinated me because it's frequently reported by people who have scent hallucinations. And so I've always kind of fantasized about this smell being very strange that why do people smell burnt oranges? Of all things, so strange. Um, that takes me into a piece that I think blends the senses really wonderfully. Uh, I'll give everyone a moment to read this, but I call them my balter trays. It's a good amount of time. So at the bottom, you'll note that these trays are made for to be interacted with. So I, I really had this dream that people would kind of like awkwardly dance on these objects. And so to explain it, they're trays filled with materials. Uh, the first one here are cobblestones made out of uh, like just regular pine that you would find at the hardware store. And below them, I have a bunch of pine resin on the floor. And so these cobbles are also irregular. So when you walk on them, they clack, and then they crush the material below them, releasing the scent. So they'll have this kind of dry, coniferous smell. Uh, the center tray is filled with camphor leaves, which if you've ever smelt a camphor tree, they have this strong, strange, almost like mothball-like scent. Uh, and it's often associated with the sacred in many cultures around the world. It's a frequent ingredient in incense. And in some incense, it's actually the base is entirely made out of camphor. And at the far end, which is hard to see, there's a tray filled with gravel that has also been scented. It has like little granules of scent that get crushed when you walk on it. And so you can see here the camphor leaves before and after being interacted with. And so you can imagine uh, you know, people coming into the gallery, altering on these trays, dancing with each other, and then crushing the leaves and releasing the smells. And I, I really like this piece because it's a kind of hybridization. I'm trying to get as many senses in at the same time. And then this piece is another one that's really special to me. So in here is a acacia flower stem. And this stem is like aged, dried, so it has no scent at all. And then I learned that anisic aldehyde is a, it's the chemical compound used uh, that the plant produces in order to create its scent. And so this, this piece, I have uh, applied anisic aldehyde to the actual branch. I, I, it's called fumigation. You basically put it in a box with a bunch of smell. You leave it for a month. And when you pull it out, it's highly scented. And I love this idea of returning a smell to an object that had lost it. It's sort of this resynthesis of nature. Anisic aldehyde is produced in mass uh, artificially. We make it in like big vats with chemical processing. It's used a lot in the perfume industry. It has a kind of a soft, powdery, perfume-like aroma. Uh, but this idea of putting something back into nature is something that we're going to see reoccur in my work as well. Uh, and so what, the way this work 
the way this piece works is you'd walk up and you pick up this cone and you smell it and you set it back down. And so the, the shelf is there just to keep the scent contained. So what were those themes again? I think I, I, think I covered them all. So we have mixes of senses, smell, visual, touch, text, sound, and taste, uh, naturalistic versus synthetic, the hyper real, hyper bright colors, crazy textures, all that fun stuff. Uh, material theater, using lots of weird materials. Uh, Self-contradiction. Uh, <laughs> associative, making connections with feelings, not logic. And then making art obsessively. I think I've, I've done a fair job of covering that. I don't want to go too fast. I'm going to try, I'm going to like blow through this. And then um, that scent work leads on to the next obvious one. So if he's doing scent, he's going to do taste, isn't he? So uh, here's my distillation apparatus with shizo. This is Perilla fructescens var japonica. This is one of my favorite herbs. It's pretty hard to find this herb uh, out like at the grocery stores, but it's got this wonderful basil kind of rosemary kind of coriander-like scent to it. It's so unique. And I was distilling this uh, probably in 2017, and I just really wanted to eat it. I was making the essential oil for it for use in scent. And I was like, there's got to be a way to use this to make flavor instead. And that brings me to my botanical flavor project. Uh, and so I did. I learned that you can bottle it. You can reduce it to a safe quantity for consumption. And then I got this wild idea. Like, what if I made something equivalent to vanilla extract, but it was a bunch of plants that no one's ever heard of? And I was like, wow, that'd be crazy. So I ended up making 120 of them either from distilling them myself, getting essential oils from other people, or getting commercial scary chemicals and using them. So for instance, anisic aldehyde is edible. So I could just make an anisic aldehyde flavor instead of a scent. And I thought that really exciting. So this is a great photo. It has the catnip, which I distilled earlier, came from those seeds. And then you have these little bottles, and we have orris, rose, green cardamom, and myrtle. Um, you know, some of those might be familiar, some might not. But they're like my kind of quintessential, some of my favorites. And then here is like this scary bottle of black fluid with a bunch of recipes on it. This is actually a recipe for a enhanced ginger beer. So I was really interested in making ginger syrup, but it like had like so much more going on. And so I kind of like was thinking like, well, root beer like, but also mystery and like all of these new ideas. So we got a lot of stuff in there that you would never find in any food under any normal circumstances. But that evolved into this crazy project where I was trying to make absurd foods. And I was trying to use these flavors as many ways possible. It's obviously not easy to explain. Like, I don't have as much visual information as my previous work on this kind of stuff. So here's more bottles. Just getting at the sense that I just created an army of these things. And I found it really interesting just to take them and say, well, the, uh, using these flavors is a way of putting artwork into your food. So I don't necessarily need to make like, a food that is an artwork. I want to make an object that enhances or changes the outcome of a situation. And so I was kind of giving this away to people being like, yeah, go ahead and put some silver fur in your oatmeal. It'll be delicious. Um, and so there's like, a lot of weird outcomes with this project, but I think the real essence of it is this idea that I can kind of co-opt flavor and use it in an art context. And that gets me to the next project I did with flavor. Uh, this is my salt project. Here are the salt shakers, empty. Uh, basically, I created a set of 12 salt shakers that I would give away to people. And each of them was filled with a salt made from a different material. And if you want to know, well, where are you making the salt from? Here is a not fully comprehensive list. But we have things that make it sweet, things that make it salty, savory, sour, bitter, numbing, creamy, hot, alkaline, astringent, soapy, cold, slimy, and gritty. So you can see the list kind of goes from normal to not so familiar. But then I, I got this idea that I could recombine these salts into like a single shaker. So I can make creamy, hot, sour salt. Or I can make creamy, gritty salt. Or how about like some slimy, astringent, bitter salt? <laughs> and so this project, I love this project because it's not, it's like, it challenged me. It's like, it's non-visual. Like, what, I'm going to show people a bunch of salt shakers. Two, all of these ones I've selected are all just white powders. So when you mix them together, they're indistinguishable. They just look like salt. Uh, three, people understand exactly what I'm up to just by hearing the name. So when I say like, oh, have some hot, cold salt, they're like, yeah, that's going to not be fun. 
But um, this project for me is uh, almost to the degree that it's more about the names, it's more about these words, it's about the associativeness of what's happening with all these strange ideas than it is actually using them. Because using them in general, almost all of these combinations is not a great idea. But maybe, you know, maybe sweet, salty, sour salt, or sweet, salty, savory. But as soon as you get towards the bottom, you know, no one wants soapy salt or gritty salt or, you know, slimy salt's interesting. It usually it gets a good laugh. But yeah, this is, um, this is a kind of the culmination of this brain thinking about like making smells led me to like, oh, I'm gonna make weird salts. Um, and this project led me into yet another where I was like, man, these concepts are so interesting but the outcomes are maybe not as interesting as the actual process of making these things. And so my final one has no visuals at all. It's called fortification. And so for me, fortification is this idea of fortifying something. You know, fortified wine has alcohol added, so it's shelf stable. And so if I fortify flavors and spices, I can make something new. So the first one that I made, it was the idea of like, oh, I have sage. And I can make the sage stronger if I add sage oil to it. And so if I fumigate the spice, now I have a super spice. But I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And so I was like, oh, I have juniper berries. But juniper trees make a cone that looks like a berry. It's a little squishy thing, so we call it a berry. But spruce trees make cones that you can't eat because they're hard like wood. So what if I made spruce berries by taking juniper berries and adding spruce oil to it? And so I made the world's first spruce berry. <laughs> and then my favorite of the set, which I brought with me, I have a little jar of it, is called Lawong. And so Lawong is a very rare and endangered species of cinnamon. And it's only grown on the island of Java, and there's kind of a preserve where they grow them. But Luang isn't really used for culinary reasons. It's used in the perfume industry. So what they do is they, select, they basically cut down a select amount of them, use it to make an essential oil, they distill it into an oil, and they sell it to perfumers. But they don't sell it as a powder like cinnamon powder. So I took a tray of cinnamon powder, and I put it down on a tray, and I left it out for a week until it lost all its aroma, and then I put it back in the jar, and I fumigated it with Luang oil. And so now I have what may be the only world's jar of powdered Luang. So I can pass this around for people to smell this, or you can come up here and smell it at the end. But the idea here is that I've invented maybe a different spice since ever existed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and so anyone who's confused on what cinnamon smells like, I brought regular cinnamon too. <laughs> but yeah, this is like this idea. It's like crazy. Like what? And so I was like, where can I go with this? And so my last version of it, which I don't, is I'm working on it now, was like, can I take something that's inherently scentless and then add a scent to it? So I, I, I collected these banyan figs. So where I live in Southern California, we have some of these huge fig trees called banyan trees, and they have these figs on them that are hard like rocks. You can grate them like nutmeg, but they're scentless. They have no scent at all. And I was like, well, what would be the most ridiculous thing to scent this like? And I was like, oh, Easter flowers. <laughs> so uh, I thought, oh, I should make it smell like hyacinth. So right now I'm in the process of researching what is in hyacinth, where I can buy it, and how to make figs smell like hyacinth so I can grind them over my drink like nutmeg. <laughs> but I love this idea. It's synthetic nature. It's like all of these things I'm talking about out of control and like hyper realistic. It's like going, going nuts. But hopefully by the end of my tenure here, I'll have figured that one out. All right, now for like the nitty gritty of this talk. So this is the, everyone's here. They want to hear about my sound works. I thought I'd go through everything first and end on this beautiful topic. So we're going to start at the, somewhat at the beginning. So Michael Parker talked about our collaboration. Uh, we made these things called juicerinas. I'm talking about them at the end because they're super cool. But for now, we're gonna talk about these. These were a response to the juicerinas. The juicerinas are these like strange art objects. They're very convoluted, difficult to play. They're about the body. They're sound sculpture objects. And I just really wanted a version of it that was easy to play. And I wanted like different sizes and I wanted them all working the same and I wanted them super intuitive to play. So this is what I call my pitch fluid ocarinas. Uh, and then the ensemble is called stolen voice because I think they sound a lot like talking or like chattering. And so they, they've taken your voice away and they've replaced it with something strange. And so the best way to explain what these are like is to just pick one up and play it. So this one is, I think, 
that one right there. And so, <laughs> as you can tell, uh, they have only two holes. And so it's like, if you take a bunch of little holes, like a normal instrument, and you just smoosh them together, you get this super simplified version of an instrument. But because there's only two holes, it has these wonderful pitch beds. Just <laughs> kind of like a theremin. And so they come in all different sizes. I have a little itty bitty one here. This is a range I call bird. So, you know, same idea, exactly identical structure, but just a lot smaller. And so, um, as you can see, they kind of get really, really small. As a matter of fact, they get ridiculously small. <laughs> and so, I have two of them here. <laughs> so, this one is larger than anything shown. This littler one is about the size of this one. And I got this weird idea. I was like, wow, these go really, really high pitched. Can I go above the human hearing range? I was like, that's an obvious goal. Everyone loves music they can't hear. <laughs> and so I'll play the larger one first. So you can kind of do a hummingbird with it. You guys can even hear that. <laughs> and then they have the even smaller one. And so this one, I'm going to play the low note, then the high note, and then I'm going to ask you guys a question. So I'm going to play it again, and I'm going to start low and go high. Everyone raise their hand when they can hear it, and lower your hand when you can't. I love watching the hands fall out. It's still playing when I blow really hard into it. I know it's still playing because we were, we were playing around with it yesterday. Yeah, so I brought one example. This one goes above the hearing range, and my goal was to make one that went entirely outside of it. So the one at the end of that little display, the lowest pitch is completely outside of the human range, and it just goes up from there into orbit. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to show that to everyone, that you can actually make a little clay flute that plays above the human hearing range. It's kind of a fun goal, if you ask me. And so now we can see, oh no, his tendency to go absurd is creeping in. Um, so <laughs> I made the world's smallest, and I was like, oh, I better make the world's biggest. <laughs> And so I did not truck this up here with me. I'm so sad. I should have done it. But here is the world's deepest pitched ocarina, as far as I know. I'm so excited for somebody to correct me because it's really deep. It's, it goes below the range of a cello. And so it has um, the lowest note it plays is F1. It's the lowest note on a cello is C2. So it's deep and it's huge. It's like this big and you gotta like put it between your legs and then I use a big piece of plastic that I warp and I cover it with it. But yeah, um, this is I made right, right before coming. I made this in September of last year. And this is me taking it home from the ceramic studio where I had it fired at. And I just, I love this photo. It's so, it gets at perfectly exactly what's going on here. Uh, here's some more ocarinas that I made. These are also in the last year. I, I, as you saw, that other one was this big cylinder. So I do make kind of normaler instruments. So these, these large instruments are very deep in pitch. But you can hear they play at a normal scale. And you can play familiar music on them. So that, you know, they do play. I, I do make normal instruments. And then the, for everyone that knows what an ocarina is, I can track back and show you a normal ocarina.
So this is, if, you, if you're familiar with the instrument, this is what they normally like. None of my other ocarinas make sense comparatively. <laughs> I'm Latin American, and the ocarinas that we use, they don't have all those scales. Like, they only have like four. Yeah, yeah, they usually have only four holes. Ones. Yeah. Yeah, in, in a way, these ones are much more similar to the pre Columbian ones, because uh, a lot of them are about making animal noises. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and so you can see, um, I, I've been showing a lot of these instruments as just raw clay. Here's what a lot of them look like when they're done. I love really, really colorful instruments. I even incorporate some with some crazy writing on them, too. Um, and then I'll get to the next one. So I, I was mentioning that my instruments keep getting crazier. It's true. I, I have this insatiable need to go into chaos. And so I call these my poorly behaved tubes. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't bring any of the originals, but this one here, which I literally made today, is equivalent to the second one to the top. And so I call this instrument my um, dial-up flute. How many people are familiar with dial-up? Did you have dial-up? <laughs> and so from top to bottom, we have Race car, dial up, <laughs> Our broken arcade machine, <laughs> sopranino screamer, <laughs> hell flute, tenor screamer, and phlegmatic baby. <laughs> I'm so sorry I didn't bring more of them. I would have sat here on stage all day showing off these. Um, but yeah, I got really interested in the way that musical instruments can carry, instead of consonants, they can carry chaos. Because I think chaos is really interesting. It's super underexplored. And as you just saw, I just made horrible noises on stage and everyone seemed to have enjoyed it. So you can't, really can't claim it sounds bad. And that gets me to the next one. This is what I've been doing here at SOU, my, my personal work side. So these are three instruments that I made. I called them my animals. So we have a uh, screeching bird, roaring cat, and then cow horn. Um, the one in the center, that's the one I've kind of been fixating on. This big cat, this roar sound. It, it's super underexplored. So you can see here, this is literally live. I, I made this here at SOU. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I'm trying basically, I, I created this thing, and I don't fully know how it works. It, it's got some complicated things going on it. It's got a little ganglia in there. It's got like, <laughs> it's got these multiple chambers. It's harnessing chaos. And I really want to make more so I can learn how they work. So here is version two of the same idea. And so this is <laughs> so I think I'm calling this my little monster. <laughs> I love it's like it's got a beautiful face. Have you ever heard the the Mexica, the Aztec ones? Yeah, like the. Yeah, they call them death Yeah. And they make all these weird, crazy sounds. Yeah, they call them plapitzali. Yeah, so, um, so there's a researcher named uh, Roberto Velasquez. He's a, like a, he studies pre-Columbian instruments, and he's an experimental archaeologist. So a lot of my instruments are based off of his research and a woman named Susan Rawcliffe. And Roberto's work is basically he goes from museums around Mexico, and he observes the pre-Columbian flutes. And they rarely play them. They usually x-ray them. And then he goes to his studio, and he makes plaster molds that match the shapes, reconstructs them out of clay, and then figures out how they work. And he has amazing guides on his website. His website's uh, plopitzali.com. Or you can look up Roberto Velasquez. And his work is the, the foundation for this. So this is based off of, really roughly based off of a, a, a mask that's an like Olmec mask called a gamitadera. And that mask is a pre-Columbian object, but nobody knows what it's supposed to do. But they suspect that people were supposed to growl into it. And I was super fascinated by this. And so I started making multiple chambered works, thinking about that as a topic. So you're correct. Yes, there's a lot of influence from pre-Columbian instruments. <laughs> so this is what I, students have been making here at SOU. Uh, we had a ocarina workshop and I am amazed to say they all work. 
<laughs> so you can see here they have beautiful colors. They got to pick their own shapes. Only thing I did, I have a claim to shame, oh, the, the, my claim is that I taught them how to turn them into flutes. And yes, everyone give them a hand of applause. Yeah, making ocarinas is overwhelmingly difficult, in my opinion. It's a very steep learning curve, and I am so proud of them for getting instruments out of the end of this nonsense. So, yeah, that leads me into this idea of impromptu performances and crazy music, because that's really... Oh, no, I have another project. Turn it. <laughs> All right, so these are my river rocks. <laughs> So I made about 150 of these, um, and I was really interested in this idea of you know, synthetic nature. So I can make fake river rocks, that's cool. And so I made a whole bunch of these and I showed them in a gallery. And you can see that there's a person spinning that one because they're musical instruments. Uh, and so the river rocks are rattles. They're basically ceramic forms filled with clay beads that are fired and when you shake them, they rattle. And I, I, I thought, how many rattles do you have to rattle at the same time to sound like water? And I thought maybe 150 would be enough. No, it needs to be a lot. But I love the idea that maybe humans, like a collective mass of people, could recreate the sound of water. And so I wanted to create these instruments that were rattles that people could interact with, and then I also had these like selected scores where we played together. And so I think I gotta click on this one, yes. I won't play that too. I want to play the whole thing, but wait, why did it skip? It's supposed to go to the next slide. There we go. So here's what the score looks like. I was really interested. Uh, CalArts was built on top of a dry riverbed, but then they like bulldozed it, flattened it all out, and built this huge school on it. And so no one really knows where the riverbed was. And so I got this idea that we could do a ceremonial river where we flow through the hallways of CalArts to symbolically bring the river back to life. Now, Southern California, as many of you know, has a lot of water problems. And so we, we have a lack of rain, we have climate change, we have all of these issues. You know, it's a dry riverbed for a reason. And so I was really interested in kind of engaging all of these issues surrounding water by creating like a water instrument. And that was kind of the impetus for this idea of making a bunch of river rocks. And then finally, we can go over the big project, the collaboration between me and Michael. This is probably my favorite work I've ever done in my life. So, you know, Michael came to me, I was helping him on ceramics mode at, at Long Beach, and he's like, hey, can you turn one of these juicers I've been making into an instrument? So I did, we, made, we ended up making four, and then from there we got, we were like, oh, we need to make a bunch more. So we made these. These are our second prototypes. I love this image, it gets at like how cool they look, they're so beautiful. Michael's shapes, I, we worked together, hollowed them out, and then I turned them into flutes. And it started just that simple. We were like, oh, we'll do little improvisational things. These ones are tuned to pentatonic, so they sound a lot more like familiar music. And then Michael was basically telling me, it's so frustrating I can't play these. <laughs> He's like, you know, you and the other musicians hold them and you do beautiful things, but I have a really hard time. He's like, could we make them easier? And I'm like, yeah, I think we can. So we did the same thing that kind of this set was rooted on. We made less holes and we made them a lot bigger, so they have a big pitch bend. And that became what we call the juice arenas. And so here are some photos of people playing on them. And you can see, much like my instruments, they're these big old arenas that people are hanging, they're all different sizes, but their shapes are everything under the sun. We have melon shapes, we have conch shapes, we have all these coral shapes, we have all these unusual uh, forms and like different ways of holding them. So people are holding them in all different forms and some are really hard to hold, so like walking strange. As you can see in this photo. And this became an awesome collaboration. Uh, we ended up performing at several museums. We wrote these scores where we were interested in engaging with artworks on the walls. 
So he handed performers instruments and said, it would like go into room 37 and there's a painting of a bird, make bird sounds. Or there's a, a, you know, there's a sculpture of a whale, make whale noises. And so we handed him out to all different people and we did a large scale performance at the Getty, which is this video here. Yeah. The calling of the four, uh, the four points. <clears throat> and um, the ocarinas, yeah. the rocks. I wanted to ask you if you if you're taking also if you got inspiration from um, Palo de Lluvia. You know the the I don't know how to say it in English. It's a uh, like, uh, like a rain stick. Oh. A stick that you turn. Yeah. It has all these little. I, I have very rocks few. Yeah. Like you, like you put the pebbles inside with the rock. Yeah, it makes the rain sound. So when you flip it and you move it, it, it sounds like rain or like a river flowing. Yeah. That's very pre-Hispanic. I, I see that you, you have a lot of influence of pre-Hispanic instruments. Yeah, my, my real interest is, like I was very fascinated with in the, in the Western sphere of study on musical instruments, everyone is obsessed with consonants. They really want everything to sound clean and pure and angelic in many ways. There's a philosophy behind it that I never agreed with. I never like signed up to do that. And then when I realized that the only people researching instruments that are cacophonous, noisy, complex in their sound, referencing the natural world, referencing animals and birds and frogs and cats were pre-Columbian instruments. You know, Mesoamerican instruments from Mexico, North American instruments and South American instruments. Yeah, and so it's, almost entirely a new world phenomena. 
uh, comparative to like most world cultures are much more interested in consonants. We see distinct cultures in the New World that were interested in these really cacophonous sounds. And I find that deeply inspiring. Like that philosophically feels so much closer to what I want, what I'm grasping at sound-wise. And so it, it's only natural for me to want to research them and root a lot of this knowledge because they are the knowledge creators. They're the ones that left all this evidence of how to make these things. That, you know, you're not going to learn how to make something that makes these noises from making clarinets. You're going to learn it from other instruments that were interested in similar goals. I wouldn't call it cacophonous, but, but I, I get to it. your point. It's very primitive. Q&A? Yeah, so I'll just say, I love to stop up, end on this because it's so awesome. This is like a giant crazy piece. And Michael, editor of the video, did a great job editing together this like entire day of madness that we did. But that's it. That's the show. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, let's do q and I'll have to repeat everyone's questions so they can hear it on the recording. So go ahead. Did you have any response from animals or even plants that you had to collect? Yes. To your high pitches or your low pitches that we didn't know. Yeah, so uh, I have like an oscilloscope on my phone and it shows this little spike. So I can see that it's playing even if I can't hear it. But um, so far, like dogs, they're not actually loud. We perceive them as very cloying. But the actual volume level that these things are producing is not like a super, super loud noise. And so dogs don't respond that much because they're hearing all kinds of stuff up there that we never knew existed, right? But what I will say is um, one of the things I love to do with these instruments is make bird sounds. And I'm not, I am interested in the sounds that real birds make because there's so much character and complexity to their sound. It's like music in so many ways. It is music to them. But when you hand someone an ocarina and you say, make bird sounds, they don't actually make real bird sounds. No bird is convinced. For them, they know we're faking right away. They're like, yeah, that's not a real bird. But to humans, it's so interesting to hear what we think birds sound like. Uh, when you hand them an instrument, that you, each musician, but if you send it to like an Audubon person, they are going to make the sound of a songbird that they're familiar with flawlessly. And so it's almost like they've learned a new language. And so I, I think music, like musics around the world are languages. You know, I don't just wake up understanding Chinese opera. You gotta do heavy research to understand what's going on. And the same is with these, bird, these animal calls. They're, they're an entire language that we're unfamiliar with. And it's so great to see like a, a fledgling learner, like someone that doesn't really know how what birds are supposed to sound like, make bird noises that we love, but birds are just like, yeah, you, you need a lot of work. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, the, the, the question was, um, why are they always wind versus like using other activating forces like strings or percussive force? And uh, as you saw, I do have the river rocks. That was one of my attempts in entering the percussive realm. But um, I also have some other unusual instruments. Like obviously these are the bread and butter. These are like the good ones I like to show. But I, I've been working on making like a, a bowed psaltery, which is a, a string instrument that's bowed, because I think it has the potential to play above the hearing hearing range as well as a string instrument. So I want like this array violin that can play way up into orbit. And then I'm really interested in instruments that work with unusual manners. Like, like for instance, like, is there an instrument that I can use a plausive force to create a resonation and things like that. I think those are like the people that make experimental instruments like that are usually some of the most interesting instruments because they have unfamiliar sound qualities. Um, but yeah, I definitely am interested in it. I didn't show all of my work in the instrument realm, but I have a, I have a few that touch into it, but honestly, the, my kind of home base has always been woodwinds. I, I learned music through clarinet. I, I'm a passionate recorder player. Um, and so I'm always thinking uh, kind of like my native thought in music is with air. Time for one more question. What happened to the church? Oh, 
Oh! Oh! <laughs> right? So here's the church. Um, so me and my boyfriend decided during COVID, you know, everyone was doing their COVID projects. They're like, oh, we're going to go move somewhere else in the countryside and make a farmstead. And I told my boyfriend, we should buy a church. And then we can make it into like a huge art center. Uh, and so we ended up buying this church in Pittsburgh. Um, we each, it was very inexpensive. We each put, spent about $35,000 to buy it. Um, and so like 14,000 square feet, you know, $80,000, that's insane. Um, but it, it, it had unknown <laughs> problems that we were, we, we, we got way in over our feet. But um, for three months last year, this is where, our, this is where we lived. Uh, this is our, where we were fixing things, repairing things. And in Allegheny County, we bought this church in Pittsburgh. Uh, basically, they, they have some bylaws that there was like certain stipulations we had to do before we could have proper ownership of the building. And we got a disagreement with the seller and he broke lease. And so we were free to leave and we decided that we were <laughs> better off not to spending the rest of our lives here. Um, but I think it's like an excellent example of like a giant failure, but it's like a, a huge moment of growth for me, a huge moment of advancement for my art. And for me, it was like jumping into like this thing I didn't really know to find out what would happen. Like I learned an insane amount about repairing old buildings. I learned an insane amount about how dangerous old buildings are, <laughs> how poisonous they are, um, and how much like churches who are exempt from like regulations get away with. Uh, the church got away with like insane stuff. They just like left stuff broken that probably shouldn't have done. Um, but yeah, this is this is the church. And so uh, right before we left, I took these photo spheres and stitched them together into a tour of the church. I can also show you the creepy basement. Um, so yeah, it has this furnished basement, um, but also hiding is a unfinished part of the basement where they put all of the religious objects. <laughs> it's a super spooky place. Um, yeah, that was our church. There you go. Can we do one last one? All right, that wasn't a real question. So. Oh, yes, it had an organ. Uh, that's why I wanted it so bad. Yeah, that's, that's, that might be a little relevant. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so it did have most of the guts of a pipe organ. Uh, and oh boy, oh boy, I was so excited to get this thing running. And I was gonna switch out the regular pipes, these angelic clean pipes, with these raunchy, awful sounding monsters. And I was so ready. I was like, this thing's gonna be like a nightmare. There's gonna be like shattering people's windows down the street. And of course, we didn't quite get to it. But it was awesome to climb around in Oregon for a month and figure out how it works and get it somewhat working again because I was so close to like building a bunch of weird stuff to put in there. But yeah, uh, that's my talk, everyone. Yeah.